Um, I've worked in both the Arctic and Antarctic, and so I'll be talking to you about um, the Arctic and Antarctic and, you know, some of the basics about it, giving you some background on what it looks like, what you might expect there, and a lot of why um, both regions are really important. Um, I'm happy to take questions along the way. I think the easiest way to do that might be in the chat. So if I see something pop up down in the chat, I'll take a look at it and um, definitely stop me as we're going to ask any questions. Um, yeah, anything before I start? It was awesome meeting all of you. Uh, it's amazing that all of you are from so many different states and going to both um, poles. So I'm really excited for you. Let's see. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> My last name. Um, cool, so I'll get started. Uh, I, I'll give you a little bit of background about me. Um, I think, especially as educators, that might be um, interesting for you. I grew up in Ocean Shores, Washington, which is a little tourist podunk town um, on the coast of Washington State. And I was in band, I worked at a go-kart track. Um, so nothing special. Uh, let me see, okay. I think I've got this. Um, I went to undergrad at University of Washington. Um, I, while I was there, I did an oceanography degree in biological oceanography. So I was really interested in phytoplankton genetics, actually. Um, there's a phytoplankton toe being done over there, um, over here on the left. And um, we went to the Galapagos Islands for my uh, capstone project. So um, that's where all these photos are from. And this is me working on the ship working on chlorophyll um, extraction. And uh, this is the RV Thompson um, from the University of Washington. So I started out being really interested in biology actually um, until my last class, my senior year of undergrad where uh, we talked about a lot about climate change um, and implications about that. And I, I fell in love with that and kind of um, shifted out of wanting to be in, in biology. Um, but before I continued in science, I actually commissioned as an officer in the United States Navy and um, spent four years on two different ships and uh, traveling around the world. I saw about 20 different countries um, and uh, learned a lot, gained a lot of leadership experience. But when I got out, I was really excited to be able to use my brain for science again. Um, and I did my master's at University of South Florida. Um, even though I was in Florida, I wanted to work on uh, in the poles and to study past climate change. So I was doing biogeochemistry. Um, I'm not sure if anyone knows much about like paleo-oceanography, but uh, I, let me put this over here. Yeah, this doesn't look like Florida. Um, I was using ocean sediments to reconstruct past climate change and ocean sediments from the Arctic and Antarctic. So um, we were collecting ocean sediments um, from Antarctica in two different trips that I took. This was the first one. Um, this was to the peninsula. You can see down here, the Antarctic Peninsula where Palmer Station is. Um, this is a picture of Palmer Station. So it's a small little station out on the peninsula. Um, went on the, uh, the Gould, an uh, ice fortified ship that barely breaks ice. Um, it barely floats as well. So it's an interesting ship to be on. Um, there's an elephant seal here. We're taking ocean uh, sediment cores, as I said, so these are some cores. Um, but what I'd really like you to notice are these two pictures on top are kind of more of a landscape. This is sea ice. Uh, this brown here is a lot of algae. Um, and this is a, a lot of what the productivity is there. And there's a lot of it. Um, and then also kind of the, the landscape here, there's quite a bit of mountains 
on top of um, the I having the ice and uh, so it's beautiful and that's part of why I'm very excited for you guys to go. Um, my second trip to the um, to do field work was to also to Antarctica, but this time to um, let me get rid of this. But also to uh, this time to East Antarctica. Totten Glacier is over here. It's despite being uh, very cold and icy, um, it's a bit of a different landscape than uh, the the Antarctic Peninsula. Let me see. Question. Oh, no, that was not a, a Russian ice fortified ship. That was a, a US ship th through the NSF. Um, both ships were. Um, this ship uh, that I was on for this was the Palmer. I forgot to put a picture up here on it. But we did a lot of um, biological research, chemistry, physical um, oceanography. So we were looking at currents and things. And we were also doing sediment cores. Uh, like we were before. Um, there was a bit more biology that we saw. We were out there for a lot longer. Um, this cool crab eater seal and some emperor penguins and Adelie penguins. And then again, you can see the, um, the life that is inside this sea ice. There's lots of diatoms that live inside of the sea ice. Um, and so there's a ton of productivity there. And wherever you find places where that brown or, or yellowish ice is, you end up seeing a ton of seals and penguins and whales and things. So it's super productive. Um, and again, the landscapes um, are very different. This is the front of the ice shelf, um, Moscow University ice, um, ice shelf, which is right near Totten Glacier. And it's just a floating brick of ice um, that can be several hundred meters deep. When it breaks off into icebergs, oftentimes they are tabular icebergs, um, which is what is floating right here. You guys can all see my arrows, right? I think. Um, right. And then also this is the sea ice. So this is all floating on top of the water. Um, and you, you tend not to see the tabular icebergs as much in certain areas and um, on the peninsula, depending on where you are. But certainly in East Antarctica, they're, they can be city-sized um, or larger. So it's quite a different dynamic. And um, trying to switch. There we are. So yeah, here's kind of the difference between the two. Um, after my master's, I decided to switch gears a little bit. I was really interested in um, data analysis and contemporary ice sheet change. So I decided to go to University of Colorado Boulder, um, but more to work on the glaciology side and how oceans impact glaciers and ice sheets. Um, and so a lot of this will be taking you through some of that work and kind of getting a glimpse um, into, you know, ice sheets and things like that. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with what a glacier is. Most people around um, the U.S. would think of this probably more as a glacier. Uh, this is actually in Colorado. It's almost, it's a snowfield now. It's no longer a glacier because glaciers require um, movement. They flow due to their own um, mass um, with gravity. So they flow downhill and this one no longer moves. But uh, this is about the size you would kind of expect here. Um, but this is kind of what you would see in, in Greenland or Antarctica. This one is in Greenland. This is Helheim Glacier. Um, you can see, uh, let me make sure I'm not missing chats. Uh, if, it, if it helps, uh, Tasha, we can also relay things to you if, if it looks like it's. Yeah, um, I'm flexible, which whatever you'd like to do. Uh, yeah, the yellow green uh, sea ice that 
that happens in the Arctic as well. Um, oh, you've climbed the, yeah, St. Mary's Glacier, uh, tiny. Um, yeah, this is what I'm used to. So uh, Helheim Glacier is giant. This is four miles across. This is the glacier back here. It's flowing in this direction. You can kind of see the line going down the middle. And this is what's called melange out here. All the ice breaks off. This is all ocean. Uh, ice is, icebergs and, and sea ice are all floating on the ocean. Um, icebergs are created by the glacier and used to be land ice, whereas sea ice was formed on top of the sea, in case any of you didn't know that. What's also interesting about this picture is this line here. It's the bathtub ring. This shows how thick Helheim Glacier was recently. So it's undergone quite a bit of thinning. Um, so there's lots of change going on here, but I think you'll get into that later. For reference, the front of a glacier like this um, is about 350 feet. It's about the same size as the 35-story tower. Um, and so the ice is just massive no matter where you go in Greenland and Antarctica. Um, and as I said, uh, glaciers and ice sheets are, are made out of ice that's moving. So this is the Greenland ice sheet and this is ice velocity. So the blues and purples are where all the glaciers are around Greenland. And um, so it's relatively fast moving ice. Some of the ice moves only you know a few meters per year if you're out in the middle of the ice sheet um, near summit or if you're down at the edges um, the fastest moving glacier in Greenland uh, used to move you know, more than 14 kilometers per year um, so you could actually watch that ice move by uh, during the day if you wanted to um, Others, you wouldn't probably notice it. Some of these are only like a kilometer per year that are in blues and purples, but some of them are quite fast. So this is kind of what an ice sheet is, um, but kind of getting onto the ground uh, to see what it would actually look like on the ground. Um, this is the edge of the Greenland ice sheet on the western side. Um, the ice sheet is back here and it's kind of flowing in between the mountains that are around the edge of Greenland. Um, and it kind of flows, it looks like waffle batter, like if you were to pour waffle batter into the middle of a waffle iron and it kind of spreads, that's really what it, what the ice sheet looks like um, flowing at the edges of um, the ice sheet and these are glaciers where that's kind of getting funneled into. Um, here's the glacier, closer look at it. You can kind of see uh, the direction that it's flowing. Um, these are a bunch of crevasses. Um, you can also see it, it really looks like a stream of ice so you can see, actually visually see uh, the direction that it's moving um, from the sky, which is really, Awesome. And then you can see as we get further and further into the ice sheet, you see fewer bumps and things from, from the mountains. But those undulations kind of continue, even if they're very slight. Um, and then on the ground, this might be what the edge of one of these land terminating, terminating glaciers look like. So the Helheim Glacier terminates against the ocean, and this one terminates on land. So slightly different. I'm really interested in the ones that terminate on the ocean because of my ocean background. Um, most of my work is behind a computer, doing computer programming. I use Python. Uh, this is what I, all of my work pretty much has been, except for about two months. Um, I use satellite imagery for most of my work. Um, these are the two satellites or the satellites that I'm using. I use Landsat and um, MODIS instrument, which is on uh, Aqua and Terra satellites, which probably won't mean much to you, but you can definitely take a look at those. This is Landsat. Landsat is the longest um, running Earth science satellite that NASA has. Um, and it went up 
the first went up in 1972. You can see the length of uh, when these were each in the sky. And this is kind of the path that Landsat takes. This is just day one, um, the track that it covers, and then it'll start, start to show uh, how it fills in over 16 days. Um, you'll notice here Landsat 6 has a little dot because it didn't make it into orbit when they shot it up into space. Um, we're currently on Landsat 8, and, or, and Landsat um, 9 is planned to go up soon. Uh, yeah, visualization. Um, so this is the front of Helheim Glacier that I just showed you before, and this is what it looks like from satellite um, in red, green, and blue. This is just um, a satellite image. You can see ocean over here that's very dark. The melange is kind of bright white, and the actual glacier is um, kind of a bluish grayish color here. And when you look at it in all the bands of the Landsat satellite, um, these are the different um, ways that it would see. So it would see in blue, in green, in red. And when you start getting into the, the infrared, shortwave infrared, you start to see a very different picture. I really work in thermal, so I'm really interested in ocean temperatures. So I'm looking at um, thermal, but you can see a lot of different things. Um, you can see that land jumps out very differently in infrared than it does in, in the normal like blue, green, red. Um, so uh, this is one of the ways that we study the Arctic and we can see a lot of um, the changes that are happening and ways that you can actually take a look before you go out into um, the work that you're doing. I'm trying to get this to forward. Uh, this will be all provided to you. Each of these um, links is a, a link for looking at imagery and I'll, um, I'll take you to one of those really quickly just so you can take a look before you go if you would like to. Um, so this is the worldview link. Um, this takes images from MODIS. Uh, and MODIS gets a scan of the entire globe um, multiple times a day, depending on where you are. And you can basically click through these, see multiple, um, any day that you want since 2000. Um, you can put, there's a bunch of different data sets that you can put on there. You can see the coastline. This is Greenland here. This is Alaska. You can uh, zoom in and see you know, what Alaska looks like today, what it looked like a year ago. You can see plumes and things, um, algal blooms, a lot of um, really cool um, information. So uh, definitely take a look at that if you want to see where you're going. Um, and all of that stuff is freely accessible to you. So take advantage of that. Some of these are Landsat data, some of these are MODIS, um, but they're very easy to access. Let's see. So, um, so while most of the time I'm behind the computer processing imagery like that, most of um, the field days that I've had have looked more like this, which I think some of you will experience when you go out into the field. Um, this is in the middle of green, the Greenland ice sheet. Um, and you can kind of see in the background, there's really not much around. Uh, this is us preparing to go out into the field. Um, there's a warehouse where you get a bunch of your field equipment tested out to make sure there's no holes and things like that. Um, I think I saw there was a chat and let's look at it in just a second. Um, but yes, whether you go into Greenland or Antarctica, you end up having um, gear that's issued to you. I'm not sure about Alaska, um, but yeah. This yeah, is the, they get gear issued to them. Okay, cool. 
um, if you're going out by yourself, you're taking a lot of food. Um, we were out by ourselves. So um, this is some of the um, food that we were taking and they kind of shove all of our gear out the back of the plane and then we're on our own. There were six of us for um, this trip that I did, uh, this expedition that I did in Greenland. And we were on our own for three weeks and then went um, more north towards Summit Station and East Grip for um, another two weeks. So it was five weeks total. Chat. Um, cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so this is, we had uh, snowmobiles, sleds that we were pulling with all of our gear and um, anything that we needed to do because we were taking care of weather stations while we were out there um, and drilling some holes, which I'll show you right here. Um, yeah, generally just very isolated. So this is us setting up camp. Um, this is a 360 video, so I apologize. Uh, your computer screens don't really handle this very well. Um, yeah, this is, it takes us about a day to tear down camp, travel about 100 kilometers on snowmobile, and then set up camp again. So one day might just be um, given to the, um, the traverse, um, but we, you get very efficient at it and uh, end up being able to do it quite quickly. And then once getting there, we, um, we did some ice cores. This is a, a 20 meter ice core that we ended up doing. So maybe, uh, what is that, 70 feet? Um, there was just three of us here on this site. So we end up just, you know, taking a day and being able to do that in entire core. Um, this is what an ice core looks like. Um, when snow compacts after about a year, it becomes fern. And so it becomes much more solid. That's what this like darker uh, ice looks like is. And then this more clear, shiny, ice is, is ice or is a uh, fern that's been melted. So every year when um, it's summer, you'll get melt um, on the surface that refreezes back into the ice core or into the ice column. Uh, and you can see it in these ice cores. You can see bubbles trapped inside um, this core here. When you hear about gases being, um, uh, being measured in ice cores, that's what you're getting. There's a bunch of um, bubbles of air that are trapped in ice cores. And when you go back um, further in time, way deep into the ice sheet, those are, it's pretty predictable um, what age those are when you can count layers. Um, so that's one of the things that we do to reconstruct past um, histories in either the Antarctic or Greenland. Um, and this is what one of these cores might look like. So you can distinctly see where the fern is and where the actual ice melt is. And these melt layers are a little bit different um, than what ends up being compacted into ice way deep and um, more like 100 meters down into the ice. These are reflective of summer warming. And um, you can see that they're different from year to year. Um, some of these are annual layers. Uh, and so this is one of the cores that we uh, drilled while we were there, which was really interesting to see. Here's the top, the youngest part of the ice core. It comes down here. And then here's, um, it continues on here until the very bottom. And one thing you hopefully will notice is differences in color. Um, you can see a lot of fern interspersed with ice at the bottom of this ice core. But when you get to the top uh, 10 meters or so, it's almost continually iced. 
Um, so this is what we're looking for when we go out there. Um, you can visually see that there's been a lot of melt recently um, in comparison to, you know, maybe 30 years ago. So um, this is just one of the fascinating things that we came across during this trip that we did um, and were able to measure. And this is something that you can see in a lot of different places around Greenland. Nice, good question. Yes. How many years does that 20 foot core cover? Like from the top to the bottom? How many years ago was the bottom? Um, so this one was, uh, let me see, I need to remember for this one. Um, I think this one was 50. Um, it's supposed to be about a meter. Yeah, I think this one is about 50 years. Um, yeah, this is definitely the last um, decade or so that's at the top there. Uh, I could, I could look it up to make sure because each of the cores was a little bit was a bit different. Um, but yeah, it's quite a bit of history in there. No, that's good. I just I had no reference if it was 10 years or 100. So oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Tasha, there's another uh, question from Sarah Johnson. Uh, oh. She said it will be curious to know how you transported these cores home snowmobile, plane, train, automobiles, all the way back to Boulder's ice core facility. Um, so for us, um, we didn't, most of us did not need to bring the ice back. Um, what we were doing was taking photos. Um, and documenting density. So we had uh, a scale where we'd measure um, one meter chunks or uh, no, 20 centimeter chunks of this ice core. And so you measure the length and the width and the density or and the weight of it and you'd be able to determine um, its density. And so by doing that, you can say whether it's ice um, or whether it's fern quantitatively. Um, we weren't taking the any of these cores home, but some people might melt it depending on what they need and melt it into bags and take that. Some people, um, if you need the actual ice core um, to stay intact, then they would have large ice chests that you would take through customs all the way back to an ice repository. Cool. Um, so uh, that was my first expedition while I was here in Boulder. Um, but my second was to Antarctica. This was last year that I went. Um, and this was not on the ice sheet. Again, this was on the ocean. Um, so here's Antarctica with another ice um, velocity image. So you can see where each of those are. Uh, those large uh, glacier areas. I know some of you are going to McMurdo, which is right down here. Um, our cruise was out here to the Amundsen Sea, to Thwaites Glacier. Maybe some of you have heard um, of Thwaites Glacier recently because it's been in the news a lot um, because of the International Thwaites Glacier co Collaboration, which we were a part of. Um, on this cruise, I wasn't actually, my main job was not to be a scientist. It was to be um, a media specialist or a media, um, a media coordinator. I was serving as liaison between the media on board. So maybe um, if you've seen pieces on this in Rolling Stone magazine or Public Radio International, both of those um, reporters were on the ship with us. Um, and because of my background in the Navy, I was able to do this. Um, whereas uh, I wouldn't normally have the training to do that in, um, with my scientific background. So that afforded me this opportunity to go to Antarctica. And yeah, cool. Yeah, I know that there was someone on the, on the cruise this year um, to Thwaites as well. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, Sarah Slack. Yeah, I wish I was on that cruise right now. Um, 
yeah, so this is, this is, this trip was uh, incredible. I got a lot of um, great images and got to participate in a lot of the science, even though I wasn't, um, I was helping with the media. Um, this is kind of a picture for scale for the ice there as well. This is an iceberg, actually. It's not attached near Thwaites Glacier. Um, but this is our, our seal tagging team, which I'll show you a picture of what they do. Um, hopefully this will play. This is a drone video um, flying over some of the islands where we were doing seal tagging. And this is, these are a bunch of um, seals that are sitting out, crab eater seals, Waddell seals. Um, that we wanted to check out and hopefully tag. Uh, and here's a little video on what we did. So this is the ship down here. This is the Palmer. This is where uh, I did most of my uh, work on the Palmer, my, most of my cruises. So this is a head bag that we go, that would go over, um, the seal's muzzle after it was tranquilized, um, or sorry, before it was tranquilized, and then they would, someone would come up, this is what this guy's doing, Guy, he goes up and, and puts the tranquilizer in the back of the um, seal, and then they put these tags on their heads, which are um, CTDs. Some of you will get to be familiar with this if you're doing any ocean work. They measure uh, conductivity, temperature, and depth. So they tell you what the ocean temperature is, salinity is, and what depth that was taken at. And um, it's put onto the seal's head, um, which they don't notice. You can see it up here, what the tag looks like. It transmits back to, um, back to them in Scotland. And uh, it's put on either Waddell seals or elephant seals. And yeah, they partner with us. We learn about their movements as seals, um, what their feeding behaviors are, their diving behaviors are. And we also get to learn about what the ocean is doing in the times when the ship can't be there, which is most of the year. Um, so we get measurements for, I think we were transmitting still. Um, in November or December from one of the seals. And when they molt once a year, it falls off. So um, it only stays with them for a year. But we get a ton of data from that and it's kind of a partnership between scientists um, and seals that has been spectacular for improving our understanding of both the Arctic and Antarctic. Um, So looking at a lot of these images and videos, you can kind of guess a lot, or also based on your background, why um, the Arctic and Antarctic are so important. Um, but I'm gonna go through those a little bit more here. Um, obviously they have diverse ecosystems, which are really important. Um, I'm gonna change sharing here again. and show you um, the biosphere, so they're, how productive they are. Uh, this, by the way, is science on a sphere. These are data sets that you can also access for teaching and things, they're pretty incredible. Uh, make this a little bit easier for you to see. Um, so this is looking at productivity around the world both on land and on the oceans. So this is from um, phytoplankton. Uh, and I'll... So here's the Arctic. If we play this, you can kind of see this sort of breathing with the seasons. Um, the person, I forget who it was, working on phenology, like that's something you're really interested, is in this seasonal change and the timing of that each year. 
but you can see by the the green colors especially in the ocean and uh, dark green on land especially in summer um, and late spring that that the arctic and antarctic are really productive areas um, and those places where you see those green colors are areas where you're going to have a, an ecosystem that can support a lot of larger animals. Um, so switching back. So as we have already seen in a lot of the pictures, um, having a lot of that primary productivity that was shown in that globe image um, yes science on a sphere is amazing um, yeah so it supports ecosystems where you can see um, larger more charismatic megafauna like the um, emperor penguins and seals um, in the arctic you will see polar bears this was a pic um these were images from churchill that were taken from a researcher here um also uh birds there's a lot of um different kinds of whales that you'll find in uh, both the arctic and antarctic um as well as fish populations and caribou and uh, muskox and things like that that all support local um, indigenous peoples and anybody um, else who lives there. So these are really rich ecosystems that pro that provide a lot of food for um, for uh, like fisheries and, and things like that. There's also, of course, um, a lot of shellfish industries that are in, say, Alaska. Um, that are affected by changes in the um, Arctic. Tasha, we have a couple of comments. Uh, one from Sarah Johnson. She says, so interesting. Wonder about other multi-parameter environmental sensors One second. Um, out there <clears throat> that are used on animals. I know of such things on buoys, but not on animals. Yeah, actually they have, um, these tags are used on seals. They have variants that are used on smaller animals. Um, they apparently have uh, backpacks for, for penguins. Um, they, they have much more uh, temporary ones that fall off, fall off after a day or several days um, for smaller animals. Um, but they're built by some of the same scientists that do some of the seal tagging. So. Um, yeah, there's a lot of expansion still possible there. Um, I think they're working on smaller instruments and more cost-effective instruments. I think each of these seal tags is about $4,000 right now. So um, yeah, there's a lot of growth and expansion in those areas. Um, if I showed you how, how much data there is, it's incredible across the globe um, with this kind of research. But um, I'm not aware of any other kinds of things yet. Okay, um, Katie Gavinus um, mentioned it's really cool to be looking at the primary productivity visualizations right around the spring equinox. And also there is an article that she um, gave us a link to in the chat that talks about Narwhal's document, Continued Warming of Southern Baffin Bay. Yeah, um, I actually have had very little ex well no experience with narwhals um so i'll definitely check that out um i have sadly never seen a narwhal <laughs> uh but yeah those are incredible animals as well um yeah so continuing on with diverse ecosystems there's ecosystems that you won't find anywhere else in the world um especially that are threatened, you'll hear more about climate change and its impacts with, uh, I think, Mark Cerez's talk, if you haven't had that yet. But um, there's permafrost, um, which is frozen ground, and especially in 
the Arctic and, um, or sorry, in Alaska and Canada. And you can see that um, here, some of it has broken off at the coast, but it provide, it, it holds a lot of nutrients. Um, there's a lot of life that lives in those permafrost regions. The dry valleys, which I know, um, I'm forgetting everyone's name right now. Um, I'll think of it later. Uh, but dry valleys, there's actually very little life there. And as was mentioned earlier, it's mostly um, invertebrates and things like that because it's so dry and uh, so cold there. Um, but there's also not much snow or uh, ice. And then the boreal forests uh, and uh, all the way to tundra. So there's a lot that you'll find um, outside of Greenland and Antarctica in terms of, of life. Um, obviously these regions provide water resources, especially for the people that live in um, Greenland and Alaska and um, yeah, so water resources are a big deal from these regions and food. Um, things that will be a little less intuitive is are thinking about heat transport um, across the globe and how the Arctic and Antarctic play into that. I'm gonna go to another SOS. Um, another SOS data set here. So this is a little bit more on the oceans. This is ocean circulation. Um, these show currents around the globe and colors are ocean temperature. Um, so what you'll notice in the Arctic um, is some really interesting oceanography. Heat is transported from the equator through the Gulf Stream and it comes off the coast of the U.S. Um, at uh, around North Carolina and comes over towards Europe. And this, the Gulf Stream here brings a lot of heat over to Europe, which is why Europe is fairly warm for the latitude that it's at. Say like the UK is very similar to Washington State, although um, it's about 10 degrees further north. Um, so there's a lot of heat being brought up towards the Arctic from the Gulf Stream. Um, and then it goes into the Arctic and flows south along Greenland. And uh, so you have a very interesting uh, ocean configuration there that's very different than the Antarctic. In Antarctic, Antarctica, because it's isolated and separated from all other continents, has what's called the circumpolar or Antarctic circumpolar current that runs around Antarctica. And it kind of isolates it from the rest of the world's ocean. So a lot of heat is not really, doesn't really penetrate at the surface um, toward Antarctica. However, it does at depth um, in both locations, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but they have very different um, oceanographic settings, which um, makes them very different in how they've been, how they respond to temperature changes and things like that. Um, Antarctica is a little bit more isolated, uh, except for here at the peninsula, um, in comparison to the Arctic, which is um, has a lot of warm water coming up um, from the Atlantic into it. Um, and because of the special uh, o ocean circulation configurations that happen there, um, you get a very, let's skip that. Um, there's some very interesting processes that happen oceanographically in both Antarctica and the Arctic um, that you uh, will also end near Alaska that um, 
are important for the entire globe. So in this is called the, the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, or also thermohaline circulation, which thermo, heat, haline, salt. Um, it's circulation driven by heat and, and salinity changes. And the red here, the red is all surface currents around the globe, and the blue is deep water currents. Um, and what's really special about the North Atlantic and um, Arctic areas is that here, surface water becomes deep water. And so that Gulf Stream current that's bringing heat up into the Arctic is super salty. And when it starts to cool off, it becomes more dense and it sinks. Um, and it becomes isolated from the surface. And so what actually happens around Greenland and also Antarctica for, uh, for uh, circulation, uh, different, there's different circulation happening in both, but around Greenland especially and into, um, into the Arctic, deeper water is actually pretty warm compared to the um, atmosphere and compared to freezing temperature. So when you worry about the ocean impacting glaciers um, and things like that, you're worried about a lot of this deep water that has um, sunk um, because it's still about, it's still above freezing. It's still about one degree Celsius and carries a lot of heat with it. Um, so when you hear about the ocean melting glaciers, that's usually what they're talking about is this deep water that, um, that sinks here. And this deep water sinks here um, because of that cooling. So you can imagine that if something impacts the heat, uh, or like prevents it from becoming cool or prevents it from being as salty. So say a lot of the ice sheet melts into that area, you can affect this global circulation um, mechanism that starts here in the North Atlantic and goes around the globe. Another place where that deep water formation happens is in Antarctica in a few different places but it happens due to um, different processes. So in the Arctic, a lot of it is due to just salty water becoming cooler. Um, but Antarctica, it's mostly driven by sea ice that is forming. And when that sea ice forms, this is grease ice. This is the very beginning of um, sea ice formation. You can see where there's open water. Um, and this is pancake ice, so this is after it started to develop a little bit more. We can imagine as that ice is freezing at the surface, is uh, it's forming from salt water, and that salt is, is rejected from sea ice. So it becomes a brine uh, that makes the water immediately below it more dense and makes it sink. And the water here is super cold. Um, so that water becomes super, super dense um, around Antarctica and um, becomes deep water. And so this is kind of what that forming pancake ice looks like for scale against those penguins. Um, so I want to move back one. Um, so both locations are extremely important for global deep water circulation um, that feeds into the Indian Ocean, that feeds into the Pacific. And then near Alaska, that water actually comes back to the surface um, and provides a lot of nutrients uh, and then returns back to the Atlantic, uh, back towards the North Atlantic and to the Arctic where it will um, it, re it will return um, through that entire loop. And that loop can take about a thousand years, but it's really important for a lot of the climate um, changes that we've seen um, in the past. Because uh, when you get deep water formation shutting down, then some of these loops kind of turn in different directions. Heat can no longer be transported into the Arctic. Uh, so polar regions for oceanographic reasons are very, very important. Um, I skipped over this really quickly. 
another reason why the Arctic and Antarctic are so important is because so much ice is stored there, um, six meters of sea level, so that's, or, and 60 meters um, in Antarctica, that's about um, a little, it's like 220 feet worth of sea level um, are stored on top of, uh, in these sheets. And of course that matters for places like Miami. Um, and then of course, Arctic sea ice, which um, I'm sure all of you are aware is really important um, because it's changing a lot. But um, what's most important about this and about land ice is that it's very reflective. So um, because it's white, uh, it's reflecting a lot of the energy that's coming from outer space on um, into the Earth's atmosphere. And it will reflect that back into space and prevent it from contributing to warming. Um, so of course the Arctic and Antarctic because of the ice that's contained there um, are very important for regulating global temperatures. And uh, all of these things put together, the Arctic and Antarctic also affect global weather um, variability. So this is the jet stream. These are winds, which you can see kind of run around um, snake-like across the planet. And so changes in temperatures that happen between the equator and the Arctic um, affect uh, those that jet stream, which changes um, our weather patterns because anything north of this jet stream is uh, cold Arctic weather or, or yeah, Arctic air and anything below is much warmer. So as this shifts around, it changes where uh, your cold weather is and where your warm weather is, which happens a lot here um, in Colorado, which is why we have warm weather today and freezing snow, um, lots of snow tomorrow. It's because um, of the jet stream. So uh, yeah, so lots of, reasons to care about the Arctic and Antarctic and hopefully a lot of background that you've kind of gathered just through my travels and through this presentation. Um, yeah, any questions that you have for me? Speak up everybody, you can just ask away. Yeah, what happens in the Arctic definitely doesn't stay in the Arctic. <laughs> uh, yeah, and hopefully um, there's those resources. I'll put um, the SOS. Um, I don't actually think, oh yeah, I do have the, the SOS uh, URLs on this um, presentation. So you can access them. There's thousands of data sets through the science on a sphere, so um, have at that. They're great for educational tools. I have a question yeah. about the conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at the graphic and it shows that there's both a cold and salty current and a warm current happening around Antarctica. So there's both? Uh, so the, red, the red is surface. Okay. Um, and the blue is deep, but actually, yes. Um, I mentioned it a little, I talked about it a little bit in Greenland, but in Antarctica, there's also a warm layer um, that's a few hundred meters, so um, several hundred feet below the surface um, is some warm water. So at the very surface, it's there's a lot of melt that's there that makes it very buoyant and sit at the surface. Um, and it's also exposed to the air, so it can get really cold and lose a lot of heat. But a little bit below that is warmer water. And it, to us, it's frigid, but anything above freezing, which is minus 1.8 for salt water, anything above that temperature in Celsius um, is warm to the glaciers and ice sheet around Antarctica and Greenland. So in both locations, you have water that's below the surface 
that seeps in um, to melt glaciers and and things. And those are kind of impacted by where that circumpolar current is around Antarctica, which is driven by the winds. And so, um, so yeah, you see some variability in that. That's kind of like a cold, warm, cold layer as you go down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I have, <clears throat> I have a question um, that's related, but it's not something you've talked much about, but I was recently re looking up this idea that there's actually a layer of fresh water on top of the sea, the salty seawater. And I was surprised to learn something like this. And I, I was like in, in the Arctic, this where I was reading about this. And I'm just curious if you can give a explanation yeah. on that. I mean, I was reading about it, but I'd love to hear your explanation. Yeah, and it, it's kind of connected to, to what um, I was just talking about. So like when you have sea ice melting or when you have glaciers melting, um, fresh water is less dense than salt water. So it, it tends to sit at the surface. Um, if it, as long as, if it's happening at the surface, then um, it's gonna create a fresh water, what they call a lens, fresh water lens at the surface. Um, so a lot of the water that comes out of the Arctic, um, as I was showing, that flows down here um, from the Arctic along Greenland is very cold and also very fresh because you have a lot of sea ice and glacier melt um, wrapped into it. So, um, so that water tends to sit right at the surface and everything else that's sal salty sits below it. Um, because it's slightly more fresh, it's easier to freeze. Um, and so that helps contribute to sea ice production in, this, in the winter time. Um, yeah, anything else you wanted to know about it? That generally? Um, no, that's cool. I I just, it's a, uh, it's just a fascinating concept that I had never really thought about and think about like what it means to the, how does that have any, I'm so curious how that layer of water might get used, even, I don't even know, but by like the people in the Arctic um, or how it, what their relationship is to this, this fresh water versus the ocean salty water. And it just opens all these questions and ideas for me. I don't know. Yeah. So generally, um, depending on how much melt is actually going into it a lot of times it's relatively fresh but it's not uh it's not like you could access it for drinking um because it's still salty it has some it's it's fresher than salt water um depending how much is pouring in obviously and that'll change throughout the year uh but generally you would have to still do something similar to what you would have to do for salt water to be able to drink it. It's still relatively salty. Because it's getting mixed with salt water as it, as it gets moved around. Yeah, some communities in Alaska use sea ice as a source of fresh water. Yeah, there's a little bit of salt that can sometimes get trapped in the sea ice, but for the most part, it's pretty fresh. So that wouldn't surprise me. Good questions. Yeah. Anything else? So with climate change, there's always basically just winners and losers in an ecosystem. You know, there are things that are going to benefit from the changes and things that are going to, um, and you talked about the more charismatic animals, but what types of significant changes have we seen with those foundational organisms? Um, you know, like the, the, the algae and the microorganisms in both the Arctic and the Antarctic, are they similar in their changes as far as, um, you know, how they're being affected by these changing currents and the changing ocean temperatures, the yeah. salinity levels, all the I, things. I know that's a really complex thing to answer. In. Yeah. Um, I can, I can kind of touch on that. I'm not sure what, what Mark is going to touch on in his climate change conversation with you guys. 
Um, so I don't want to steal his thunder. I, he doesn't do biology, so maybe he won't touch that quite as much. But um, yeah, there a lot a lot of it's being affected. Um, the very base of the food chain, like phytoplankton, a lot of that really shifts with where nutrients are in the ocean and where the edge of the sea ice is, because that's where a lot of nutrients are. So as the edge of the sea ice um, moves, a lot of those really productive areas are just kind of shifting. Um, but those communities are a lot more resilient um, to changes. Uh, in Antarctica, we heard a lot about how penguin colonies are shifting and um, their, their colonies depend on ice and sea ice and being able to um, feed and things while they're young are being, um, I forget what the word is, reared. Uh, but so I know penguin colonies are experiencing a lot of trouble in Antarctica, depending on the species. Um, obviously, you know that polar bears are. Uh, there are some fish species that um, are shifting or having more difficulty because of temperature um, re requirements. Uh, and I'm not as familiar with most of those kinds of things, uh, those animals, but um, I, I have heard here and there that a lot of, a lot of these things are shifting. I mean, when we were in Antarctica, it was really interesting. Um, have any of you heard of sea pigs? <laughs> uh, they are invertebrates that look like little pigs, but they're, um, they're part of the family of sea cucumbers. Um, and they just eat detritus off the bottom of the ocean. And we were catching those in our sediment cores, which are about, you know, like a, a, like six inches across or something. So there had to be millions of them because we caught two of them um, in our tiny little sediment cores. Uh, but like things like those are beginning to be more prevalent, it seems like, and some like, um, like they're talking about, uh, I forget what species of crab are becoming more prevalent um, in Antarctica and things like that. So definitely the ecosystems are shifting a lot. Oh, uh, um, I had a question. Um, you have those big icebreakers and we had a presentations about that beforehand, yeah. uh, before the break. Uh, how does breaking up ice impact wildlife? I mean, you have these things where the, the butterfly wings on one end of the world create a tornado in the other part of the world. So does anybody think about the impact of breaking up ice and, and how a break in the ice in one part can totally change the ecosystem for another species? Yeah, so um, this is, that's definitely something that um, I was interested in when I was thinking about breaking ice, but um, when you get on an icebreaker and when you get into sea ice, especially where the icebreaker will go, usually you're going into areas where the ice is already kind of jumbled up. Um, and so breaking the ice uh, or a lot, a lot of times it's moving ice around, but even breaking ice is kind of a similar process to what's already going on when winds churn up, storms um, break up the ice that's moving around. Um, if you were to break ice that, you know, was structurally important for something, um, that might be like for a glacier or something, that might be um, something different, but that's really difficult to do. Um, most of the things that we do as humans um, uh, are not large enough to create large impacts for um, any of the ice that we um, are doing research on. Uh, so yeah, I'd say in general, um, especially ice breaking ice, that certainly is, um, doesn't really impact the environment any differently than what 
uh, is already occurring. However, if you're breaking ice and you are um, coming across seals and things like that, they're definitely, you know, at least interacting or seeing a ship coming through, which is probably jarring. Some of them are very curious. Um, yeah, but breaking ice specifically for the most part is, it doesn't have a lot of impact. Good discussion. Yeah, there was just a little bit about northward migration of other things, including both terrestrial movement as well as uh, ocean movement. Yeah, and that only the knowledge work and um, things that you guys will be doing when you go out into the yeah. field. Any uh, general questions about being in the field or um, I'm sure you you've already asked a lot of those questions. Cool. Very good. Thank you so much, Tasha. Yeah. Yeah. What really nice in depth. Um, and then thanks to Tasha, maybe in your chat, will you put your email address so if somebody has um, additional contact yeah. or questions, they can contact you directly. And then uh, thanks to everybody that joined late. I know that several of you are on the East Coast and it's pretty late there. But, um, it was very interesting. So, and we also have your presentation. We'll have this recording as well that we can share.